Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Today's guest is Yarun Ben Nun, the founder and chief technical officer of Nostromo Energy, an Israeli based company that has developed an ice thermal energy storage system that is really cool, to be honest. They recently went public in Israel, and in this episode, we talk about clean energy, why I'm afraid to have children pulling carbon out of the air, and going public, things like that. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Yaron is a character, to say the least. He's extremely funny, and I actually cut out half of the episode because most of it was just goofy and off-topic. I did leave some of that in for the end of the episode um, so that the first part of the episode is a little more serious and relevant so you can get the information from it that you want. And if you don't want to hear us be goofy together, you can just end the episode. Uh, If you want to hear us be goofy together, then finish to the end. I also want to announce before we get into the episode that this is number 93. I have already recorded to 100, so I'm working on them right now. And once we get past 100, I will be switching from audio to video. So I hope that you enjoy this shift as we mature as a podcast. Uh, We are also approaching the two-year mark that we've been doing this podcast. And my hope is that this year we will be hiring people to work on editing and producing and publishing, social media, these kinds of things. And I hope that we can grow and start to monetize what we're doing because the information we're putting out there is really valuable and a lot of people have come to me privately and expressed their joy and their appreciation for everything we're doing. So we know that there's tremendous value and the only way for us to grow and continue to provide that value is through being able to bring in money to do so. Uh, So we hope you enjoy how we evolve past episode 100 and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Yaron Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever-increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, and then we'll go from there. I think I'm an explorer by heart. I was an explorer way before I became an entrepreneur, uh, way before I knew this word even. I was enlisted to the army and uh, served as a jet fighter pilot uh, for seven years of my life. Then I finished my service and I started a career as an author, as a a director of films. I was, uh, I directed mainly documentaries and the TV commercials and television. And uh, at 2009, I uh, had some kind of a middle life crisis or something close to that. And I decided that I would like to redefine myself and my occupation and the essence of what I'm doing. I started to ask myself questions. Why am I here for? What legacy I will leave? All these questions comes when you understand finally uh, that you're going to die. I believe I was about 39, 38. I was father to two already. And I felt this, you know, the time is passing by and, and what I'm doing is is useless in, in many ways. So I decided I would like to discover if I have anything to do or to contribute or to find uh, myself more comfortable with operating in the field of the emerging clean energy. At that time, 2009, uh, solar, it was the hype of the, of the clean tech uh, bubble. Uh, if you remember, in 2010, this bubble burst and that was just two years after the subprime crisis. And uh, so I got actually in the midst of this, uh, I would say, new era collapsing. 
but I did not really care about that. I just wanted to find a place that I could, uh, you know, uh, feel that it's my spot, it's my place. Uh, anyhow, solar, I did not have anything to contribute to solar. Solar seems to get along quite good without me. So I started to work in other startup company called Phoebus, which are doing hybrid um, heating for uh, for sanitary water for hotels and uh, sports centers with uh, um, machines called heat pumps. So they do like hybrid, reducing uh, carbon to heat water for a different usage. And two years later, I uh, hooked up with two guys came from Oracle. They knew a lot about supply chain and they had an idea to make an energy management system for manufacturers, for factories. And they saw me as a big uh, one that comes with a big knowledge in energy. Of course, they were wrong. I knew very little about energy, but for them, they looked at me and say, okay, this guy knows actually what is a KWH, BTU, calories, come along. I invested in this company and today this company is called Zira. They're operating in uh, California mainly, San Francisco Bay Area. At 2006, when I was in the midst of uh, getting a $5 million grant from the CEC, the California Energy Commission for Zira, I started to see anomaly. And the anomaly was that a year before, there was an event, very you know, very like, under the radar, uh, but for the people in the clean tech energy, it was a huge event. It was the moment uh, that the solar panels prices dropped and the cost of uh, KWH from solar met the KWH cost from the grid, which was fully, you know, um, fossil fuel based. And, and from that moment on, the, the summer of 2015, it was uh, very clear that the cost of solar will drop and solar will become the main energy producer economically. It doesn't really leaning on the tree huggers uh, for, this, for this revolution to thrive. It was, it was already very sure that economically the KWH for solar is going to drop. And actually today we're talking about one and a half US cent per KWH of solar, two cents maybe. And still uh, the grid cost of energy is between eight to 12 uh, cents. So that was already proven. But in 2016, everybody started to talk about the next revolution, which is the storage revolution. And there I looked at the trends. What are the energy storage analysts are saying? And they all were talking only one thing, electrochemical batteries. Uh, since I was already deep into the big data of consumers of electricity on the grid, because uh, Zira is an IIoT, what meaning uh, industrial Internet of Things, big data company. So we gathered a lot of data. We saw the picture very clearly, and it was very obvious that the biggest consumer on the grid is cooling systems. And I knew another thing. I knew the tap water are a great mean to store cold energy per se, meaning you can use electricity when there is surplus and you can make ice, transform water to solid ice. This quality of water called the latent heat of water, water has the highest latent heat in nature's meaning the ice cube you know very closely is an amazing phenomenon for itself. You can store cold energy in very high density with water, but I also knew that there was no available technology that could actually uh, utilize this uh, phenomenon uh, in a way that could take off cooling loads in massive scale. So in a moment, should have been a little bit crazy to do that. I left the company. I came to my family and I said to them, I want to raise $100,000. Let's call it Presseed. I'm going to learn how to freeze water like no one ever before. Then I told them about the need. I told them uh, the cooling demands are what, number one growing need. That was right at 2016. We did it thought about electric vehicles yet, but it is still today one of the biggest growing uh, demand on the grid, especially in the developing countries. And if I may say so, I will develop a technology that will support water in becoming a really main player in the field of energy storage by using or surplus energy, uh, making a lot, lot of ice and then discharge this cold energy into commercial buildings, big users of, of cold energy, and uh, by that, stabilize the grid. So my family uh, like looked at me and say, okay, can you, what are you going to do with this $100,000? Say it again. 
So I said, there is a huge need. You just need to look forward. You'll understand that the world will be full of solar and the sun is setting down every day, almost every day for millions of years. I think it will keep on setting every day. And then you lose all your solar energy and you need storage to mitigate this phenomenon. And I believe that storage is the big next thing and water are cheap and clean and healthy. And then I had to give my father a glass of water. Eventually, one of my sisters gave me $50,000 and the other uh, sisters and brothers joined. And uh, last Asked my father, which is he's a well-known businessman, you know, and like um, a real gentleman. Uh, he said, okay, I'll join them. It's crazy, but I'll join them. And there was no fr- friends, only family in this round. Raised $200,000 eventually. And for eight months or so, me and uh, two partners of mine, Eyal and Dori, we went into stable. It was like a deserted the stable behind the, the my father and mother's uh, house. And we started to freeze our way towards the ice brick. A year later, we closed the, the, the seed round. It was $4.6 million. And then we already had a, um, a prototype working. It was very promising. If I'll show you a picture of it to you, you will laugh. It really looks like, you know, children trying to get to the moon, building a ship from, you know, some trees they found in their backyard. It's funny. It's only six years ago, but it looks like ages has passed already. And our second round, the seed was $4.6 million. We became public uh, half a year ago, and we raised about $30 million till this day. And we have a a working system, an amazing product that uh, actually can freeze water like no one has frozen before. And it's a modular, the basic or the heart of what we're doing is taking all these bulky, you know, big uh, tanks of water that were there for ages for this reason to store ice uh, for the industry mainly. And we took it and we built on a different technology called encapsulated ice. We built some very neat building blocks like Lego that we are in modular fashion. We are retrofitting buildings and we make these buildings, which are a great burden to the grid. We are making them the solution, making them a battery, a very clean one, like a a very sustainable one because we are using water mainly and some plastic and and metal. But our uh, technology is here to stay, meaning water you can freeze and thaw or melt for billions of times. It's a physical phenomenon, not chemical. They don't, uh, you know, age. Uh, So we have already proved that uh, after 6,500 cycles, we lose less than 1% of the ability to freeze water. So it's it's not like, you know, any other electrochemical solution which are degrading. And then you have huge problems in the supply chain to get rid of it. Uh, We believe that lithium ion is amazing but whenever you can avoid it with a simple and clean means you better avoid it especially inside buildings and uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, yeah we have a great solution we already installed two systems here in israel we are now installing the third one 1.5 megawatt hour in the beverly hilton and we have other projects coming up and um, we hope to bring water into the discussion to the heart or the discussion of that paving our future. And um, we would like to see our future full of renewable energy and uh, recyclable and clean means to support, to make, and to store this energy. And this is the only way we can believe that this idea of clean future will thrive. You cannot kill for peace, I was told. <laughs> you shouldn't kill for peace and you shouldn't use unsustainable means to create a sustainable future as much as you can. Uh, We are here to enable that, I hope. Congrats on 30 million. Yeah. And you you said you went public. I I wasn't aware you guys were public, so congrats on that. This is quite new. Yeah, we did this because it was uh, easy to get the money that way at that time. Now things are getting more complicated. So we wait and see how that will come up. Yeah, I was talking with one of my investors because we're getting ready to do our next fundraising round. And he was saying that the specific investors he wants to introduce us to would be happier if we were in a position where we could go public faster, even though we're a very early company. But he he has a means by which we could potentially go public through like a reverse merger or whatever. I don't even understand how that stuff works. But this is what we did. It's not like a SPAC, a reverse merge meaning that you are actually acquiring uh, some uh, structure that is empty of uh, activity. 
uh, the structure is already there, so you don't do all the uh, due diligence for, for becoming public. You just need to go through the, the board of directors of this um, skeleton, actually. The skeleton is buying you, but it's a reverse merge. You will get only a portion of your equity, and you will be the, the owner of this uh, skeleton. Right. So he was saying that these specific investors, they don't want to just give you five or 10 million. They want to give you a lot more. But if they have to go through the due diligence of a private company, it's annoying. So if you go public first, then they can give you as much as they want and they don't have to do all of the due diligence because it's already been done. So I'm not an expert about that, but uh, you can believe me uh, that if the skeleton is holding the money, this is a public money. So they would have to stand in the highest due diligence rough. But if the money is coming outside of the skeleton from a private company, this company is evaluating you. They say, okay, I will put in the skeleton $10 million and all I want is 10% of the shares, meaning you are evaluated, just being evaluated as a $100 million company. The skeleton couldn't care less, of course, because the skeleton, but if this, the money comes from the investors that were operating in the skeleton before you came, this is a public money. So the board of directors of this skeleton must, their diligence won't be easy one. Actually, DD that we've been through almost killed us because it took a year, but it's different if the skeleton has only the structure and no money in it. There are skeletons. Before they, they went into preservation, they sold the, the activity, but there is no money in the skeleton. You just use, you, you buy for $1 million the skeleton, for instance, okay? So you bought the skeleton from the owners of this uh, financial skeleton. It's just, it's, it's a structure. And the money comes from a third party, then you have no problem. But I'm not an expert in these fields. So don't take my word. Ask your, the guys that you pay for them, $1,000 an hour. Their answer is better. We don't have any of those guys just yet. Yet. If you're going to be public, you'll start to spend at least a quarter of a million of a dollar a year only to be public. Yeah, it's crazy. But hey, if these companies want to give us tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to build our company, I think a quarter of a million dollars a year is a worthy expense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Who, who can ever pay a quarter of a million a year just to be something, he must have much more <laughs> to be whatever he's there to be. It's an executive salary. Yeah, yeah. It's not that much. This is for the Israeli stock market. If you're going to be, you know, in the United States, in the NASDAQ or whatever, uh, I'm sure these numbers are double. Well, so we're a Singaporean company, so I don't know what that looks like, but he was talking about something about Canada, so I don't know. Well, Canadian dollar is already 30% less. It's like 70 cents. So take everything I'm saying, you know, 30 cents down. I'm joking. But I would check, you know, what is the biggest problem to go public? If nobody cares, because if you're going to be public and the, the trading in your company is low, there is a low, you know, activity, you are down. I mean, you are exposed to some mean things. Just think about it, that nobody really cares about your stock. So you need to be sure that your stock will be active because otherwise the people that already hold the money, they see that there is no activity. Not a lot of money is being exchanged every day. So they are now prisoners in your jail. They cannot liquefy their money. So somebody just lose. I had this case. Some people came to me. They were, I inherited them from the other company. They asked me what's going on. Is something going on? I said, look, this is inside information. I cannot talk about it. They became impatient and they decided to drop their money. They just drop it. And, and we lose, I don't know, like 10, 12 percent this day. Sometimes you are really being sabotaged because people are not patient. People don't really know you and what you do. What is your prospect? How much they don't have the patience. Another month is passing by. Another month is passing. No interesting things to say to the public. They might just dump their... Now, now, if there is a low activity on your stock, you can get hurt. You need to know that it's a tablet sword. Similar to cryptocurrency, where if you launch off a bunch of hype, but you don't really have anything going on, people will dump your coin. And if you don't have people making your market for you, which is technically illegal, but everybody has to have it in order for there to be liquidity for people to buy and sell, then the price of your coin could go up and down very significantly, very quickly. So I can imagine how that would be similar in, in this situation. If you are a young company and you don't have income yet, 
you are more likely to be caught as uh, something that people are gambling on because you don't show income fast enough. So this is the catch with young companies going public. Um, you are into the zone of an unknown stage where you can't show you know, high income yet. Uh, so it's all about whether I believe or And if I believe I buy your stock, then how much I will keep on believing in you. Another month pass, another month pass. If I will drop this stock, it will affect you. There's ways around this. Use some of the $30 million to have a PR team. <laughs> and their specific job is to get you booked on every TV show and radio station and podcast and everything they can all day, every day. So that it's not the paying for PR, but very little. And we had a lot of coverage here in Israel and outside of Israel. The World Economic Forum had a, a long article about us. Uh, stating that uh, every leader should think about how to promote such technology. We are huge believers in what we are doing, but uh, implementation and execution takes time and we bleed for that and supply chain and uh, co- COVID-19 and the costs of frights and so forth. But I love it. I love these challenges because we are actually doing something. We're not just bragging, you know, we are working in it. Uh, we are changing the world. This is our mission. Uh, we are proud of, of, of trying to do that or, or aiming towards that. Uh, and I believe today that either you are helping or you are pulling us backwards. Uh, and I would like to wake up in the morning and be uh, on that side of the equation, really. I totally agree. I mean, a few years ago, my team was like, look, our research has shown that CEOs are being expected to be vocal on social media about these issues, about all sorts of issues, whether it's a social issue or a political issue or a climate issue. People want to know that you're alive, you have a heartbeat and you have an opinion and they want to hear what you have to say. And I was like, yeah, but that's not who I am. Like I'm building the product. I'm focused on that. And they're like, yeah, but... If you want people to know about what we're doing and why it's special, you got to get out there. And so I, that's one of the reasons why I created the podcast, because I thought that was a really good way for me to express those views. From what I see, the companies that succeed are the ones that are on the minds of the people. Now, I personally think Trump is a horrible human being, but that guy... has the world talking about him now for six years every day because he's constantly telling people what he thinks about every tiny detail of what the world is doing so he has captured the hearts and minds of people even if they hate him <laughs> yeah no news is bad news for a company whether people are saying good things or bad things about what you're doing if they don't know about you your stock price will never go up I will tell you that when I asked myself, is going public is reasonable, the straight and the fastest answer I got was, of course, of course, and why? Now more than ever, the public should have the opportunity to be your partner since we are paving the future. And the public, the only ways he can impact the future is either with his vote or the way he lives or where he invests his money. Let's say you eat meat. I mean, I eat meat, but more and more rarely. Every time I pay for my meat, I really look at it as I am feeding this monster. And the meat, as you know, the meat is one of the biggest influences on the global warming uh, in many, many aspects. Uh, the rainforest are, are suffering a huge suffer for the meat we are eating because because all these you know protein uh, industry goes on their behalf and many, many other issues. So at this time, I think, It has a huge influence deciding to cut your meat to eat less or to go on to you know beyond meat or uh, impossible meat or whatever this has a real impact on how fast our world is changing and being entrepreneur in, in, in the field of, of supporting what we are doing in, in Nostromo Nostromo is the name of the company I'm leading uh, so what we are doing is supporting renewables now I'll tell you a secret. The ramp up is a phenomenon that is being measured every sunset in California mainly because California has so much solar that the sunset drives down the solar and that brings the fossil fuel ramp up, meaning the demands from the grid are huge while the sun is setting down. And a few days ago, a new world record was broken in California. The ramp up for three hours was 16 hours. 
16,900 megawatt drop, 16,900 megawatts. This is almost 17 gigawatts of electricity was vanished from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Through three hours of ramp up, they measured this huge demand for fossil fuel. Uh, mostly uh, they imported from, I don't know where, Nevada, Arizona, and so forth. And that shows you how extreme the grid is going to be when more and more solar will kick in. So we, as leaders of energy storage, clean technologies of energy storage, know that anyone that can help lowering this curve or this um, cliff of the ramp up uh, and discharging your energy through these three crucial hours, this is actually what helps renewable penetrate in more quantities. And California today has 16% uh, from the total energy being produced, and they have 50% goals. The 2030 goal of California is reaching 50% solar. That's going to be crazy, crazy. So we need a lot of storage in order to make it happen. Uh, we need to support storage, but I, I'm just saying try to make the storage a little bit more sustainable. While you were saying that, you gave me an idea. I was thinking about, I can't remember his name at the moment. Chuck Norris. Warren Buffett. Uh, Warren Buffett, okay. <laughs> Chuck Norris is a worthy <laughs> mention, of course. Okay. If Chuck Norris could do what everyone thinks he could do, he would just kick all of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. He would inhale it. Okay, he'd inhale it. All right, fine. So I was thinking about Warren Buffett and how he owns a company that specifically invests in other companies where they're public and so he just gets, he buys shares and he holds those shares. And- I've been thinking about how my company, even though we're not in clean tech, can do something to support it. Mm -hmm. If my company can invest in private companies like that, then there's no reason why we shouldn't also be able to invest in public companies that are doing that. Of course. Because we ourselves are completely incapable of going and being carbon zero because we are completely beholden to all of the companies that we pay for services from and none of them are are in this state. So it's impossible for us to get there. And I think a lot of other companies are in this same position. So if we can take our profit and invest in companies that are trying to do things to make these changes, then maybe we can help to get those other companies that we buy from to get there faster. It's called carbon trading in a way. You can actually buy credits for carbon. You can pay companies that has credits that they had done, you know, things that reduce their carbon emissions below a certain line. So they get the credits and you can buy these credits and decarbonize your company. But I have a more creative idea for you. If you gave a, th a thought to the carbonated drinks, all these sodas, where do they get their carbon? Where do they get the CO2 for your soda drinks? I don't know, but they should be pulling it out of the sky. So let's start now the mission to decarbonize carbonated soda. I will tell you a secret now. Almost all the soda makers, I'm not talking about Perrier, these guys, all the other companies, I won't name even one. You know them, you've drink their soda. They are making this CO2 by burning intentionally fuels. Did you know that? I did not. Isn't it crazy? So let's start a campaign. Who will be the first soda maker that will be CO2 neutral about his bubbles? Meaning how? how? I'll tell you how. If you burn biomass, this is a neutral CO2. Why? Because this biomass, if it's a wood, let's say, it took the CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah, but if you're burning it, then you're allowing the CO2. So you'd, you'd have to have a chamber and it'd have to go be funneled directly from there into the into the drink or else yeah, you they, go back into the atmosphere. No, no, they're they cooling it and they clean it and they put it in your drink and you, you, you drink it and you fart it or whatever. But it's a zero emission cycle. Then it goes back into the earth and then it has to be captured again. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. This is called neutral. All the biomass is really neutral. It really, really it is. The only problem is if you take fossil fuel, which was 7 million, 70 million years underground and you burn it, this is unneutral. This is imbalancing, imbalancing the atmosphere. So biomass fire is called and is recognized as a neutral act of burning. Really, it does. I, I did not invent it. If I was a soda maker, I would think about it myself. I would say, hey, you know what? Let's decarbonize the carbonated drinks. You are neutral, my friend. This is carbonate neutral. Drink it. 
I would drink it. I would think of how you could pull all of the carbon dioxide out of the air directly. Mm, that's This is even better. Because then you don't even have to burn it. Yeah. You don't have to burn the biomass. Okay. So you can leave the biomass. Okay, do that. Okay, let's 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 start our, our own company. We, we will take the carbon out of the atmosphere and you will drink decarbonated atmosphere drinks. Wow. We will call it... Who doesn't want to get closer to the environment? Sky, sky water. This is decarbonated from the sky and we'll take rainwater. Uh, this is perfect. It's like it's like soda rain think about the name you come up with the name i'm bad with names but soda rain think about it <laughs> sorry let, let's let's restart this conversation now we're doing all right are you optimistic i have been accused of being called pessimistic i consider myself a realist what is a realist you believe in reality really I believe that nobody knows what reality actually is. We're somehow living in a collective delusion. Okay, I, I can relate to that. If you had the fiancé or the spouse... I was married before. Okay, <laughs> and, and she came to you and she said, look, I'm pregnant. And do you really love her? Would you go for that, being a father in our world? I would do it because I love her and I love children. But I honestly think that having children right now is a really bad idea. Because now is the, the end of something or the start of something? What, what, what is now? It's both. Are you aware that this is one of the best times of, 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 for the humankind to be alive? Yeah, but I'm also aware that climate change is going to probably next the next 200 years really difficult for humans. Let's fight it together. Bring your children. I don't eat meat. I'm a minimalist. I don't buy things. I have a very low carbon footprint on an, as an individual. I'm just one you person. Great. Yeah. Everybody else I know doesn't care. I spend a lot of my energy trying to convince people to like think about these bigger things and change their behavior. And they're like, oh, but that's just too difficult. I mean, the people are waiting for a, a major crisis to be awake and deal with that. It's happening every day. Yeah. There's an ice storm across the eastern seaboard of the United States. And in a few days, it's going to be two degrees Celsius in Miami. This is not supposed to happen. Yeah. It's 22 degrees right now. It's supposed to be 22 degrees. Yeah. But it's going to be two. It's crazy. A week ago in, in Florida, there were tornadoes and floods. Of two or three weeks before that, there was a series of tornadoes, a hundred of them, that spanned 10 states and killed hundreds of people in America. This is climate change. Yeah. If people are waiting for a smoking gun and it's going to only get worse as the climate continues to increase, you know, the the uh, the temperature. So if anyone thinks that like this is a fluke here and there, oh, what was the the volcano in Tonga? You know, what is what are all these tsunamis and hurt? Like, I'm sorry, but we're living in it. Uh, yeah, and the fire in, uh, in in Southern California and the fire in Australia and the water floating this summer in New York City. That was terrifying. That was really terrifying. The floating, the underground, the subway in, in New York City. Oh, yeah. It was so crazy. That's because the metro stations were built like 100 plus years ago and the water is underneath sea level. So when you have a hurricane, it's going to flood it. When you have a tsunami, it's going to flood it. These things are not designed for it. And that stuff's not supposed to happen. And yet it is. The only explanation is climate change. What are we going to do? What, what is your plan? Well, the, the problem is these things were caused by companies and their greed. And it requires people to change their act in, on an individual basis in order to convince companies. And I, there's two ways of doing it. One is be on social media and complain and complain and complain until eventually they have no choice but to make a change because the people are complaining and society is against them. Or stop buying their products so that they run out of money and they fall apart. And the ones that change are the ones that survive. However, that's not going to happen for the most part. And they're going to keep buying from them. It's like people using Facebook products despite being disgusted about how, you know, they have disgusting business practices. But people are going to continue to use Facebook. Why? Because everyone they know is on Facebook. So we're locked. Right. You're asking for companies to change, but they don't care. You're asking the people to force the companies to change, but they don't care. You're asking the politicians to get together to make change, and they don't care. Maybe that will change. I think we've got 200 years left. Maybe. 
before the Earth is unlivable for humans. And once all the humans are gone, the planet will rebound. The animals will come back. Everything will be fine, and a new species will take over. You still have 200 years for your children. This is at least four generations. Yeah, but they're going to suffer. Why would I want to bring them in onto the Earth if they're going to suffer? Well, every human being in the history of humankind thought that his children going to suffer. If you were in 200 BC, they always suffered 200 years from today, before the, the second industrial revolution or even before the first one. They did not have an engine. They did not have the railways, trains. They did not have lights. They did not have Wi-Fi. I mean... That's not suffering. Yeah, it is. Take the Wi-Fi from me, I will kill myself. Let me tell you what suffering is. Tell me. Suffering is not having clean water, clean air, clean food. Lots of these guys, 200 years ago, had some severe problems to get clean water. That's It's different. They could get it. What I'm talking about in the future is... Wars will be fought over the last drop of clean water. But we're not there water. yet. It's just something you presume that will happen if you will sit on your ass instead of fighting climate change. Of course it will come. I do everything in my power to fight climate change <laughs> with the resources that I have. But me as an individual can't do anything more than to try to change the people around me after changing myself. Let's decide on one thing that we can do together. Let's start this campaign for decarbonizing decarbonized drinks. Let's try it light on them. Tell them you would like to keep on selling soda. Get it from the sky. Go get your soda. Then we'll buy it. Let's start a campaign together. That, that could be a great campaign. That would probably require $100 million in investment. No problem. You'll get them. Go to Bill Gates. Bill Gates will support you. So how can people follow up with you? It's Yaron, <laughs> Y-A-R-O-N, at Nostromo.energy. All right. Thank you very much for your time, Yaron. I appreciate it. If you like this episode, look forward to some of the outrageous content we're going to put out this year talking about psychedelics and AR, VR, XR, metaverse, AI, blockchain. Uh, don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And don't forget that sustainability is something we should all be thinking about and, and not just thinking about, but trying to do something about. And if that means working with the people in your team and your partners in business to find a way to decarbonize what you're doing, then that's what you should be doing right now. So thank you, Yaron. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for this amazing show.